Edward Hyde, 1st Earl of Clarendon. Edward Hyde, 1st Earl of Clarendon, 18 February 1609-9 December 1674, was an English statesman, lawyer, diplomat, and historian who served as chief advisor to Charles I during the First English Civil War and Lord Chancellor to Charles Roman II from 1660 to 1667. Hyde largely avoided involvement in the political disputes of the 1630s until elected to the Long Parliament in November 1640. Like many moderates, he felt attempts by Charles to rule without Parliament had gone too far, but by 1642 felt its leaders were in turn seeking too much power. A devout believer in an Episcopalian Church of England, his opposition to Puritan attempts to reform it drove much of his policy over the next two decades. He joined Charles in York shortly before the First English Civil War began in August 1642, and initially served as his senior political adviser. However, as the war turned against the Royalists, his rejection of attempts to build alliances with Scots Covenanters or Irish Catholics led to a decline in his influence. In 1644, the future Charles Roman II was placed in command of the West Country, with Hyde and his close friend Sir Ralph Hopton part of his governing council. When the Royalists surrendered in June 1646, Hyde went into exile with Charles, who became king after his father's execution in January 1649. He avoided participation in the Second or Third English Civil War, since both involved alliances with Scots and English Presbyterians, instead serving as a diplomat in Paris and Madrid. After the Restoration in 1660, Charles appointed him Chancellor, while his daughter and married the future James Roman II, making him grandfather of two queens, Mary Roman II and Anne. These links brought him both power and enemies, while Charles became increasingly irritated by his criticism, despite having limited responsibility for the disastrous 1665-1667 Second Anglo-Dutch War. He was charged with treason and sentenced to permanent exile. He lived in Europe until his death in 1674, a period he used to complete the history of the rebellion, now regarded as one of the most significant histories of the 1642 to 1646 Civil War. First written as a defense of Charles I, it was extensively revised after 1667 and became far more critical and frank, particularly in its assessments of his contemporaries. Personal details Edward Hyde was born on 18 February 1609 at Dinton, Wiltshire sixth of nine children and third son of Henry Hyde, 1563-1634, and Mary Langford, 1578-1661. His siblings included in 1597, Elizabeth, 1599, Lawrence, 1600, Henry, 1601-1627, Mary, 1603, Sybil, 1605, Susanna 1607-1656 and Nicholas 1610-1611. His father and two of his uncles were lawyers. Although Henry retired after his marriage, Nicholas Hyde became Lord Chief Justice. Lawrence was legal advisor to Anne of Denmark, wife of James I. Educated at Gillingham School. In 1622, he was admitted to Hertford College, Oxford, then known as Magdalen Hall, graduating in originally intended for a career in the Church of England. The death of his elder brothers left him as his father's heir, and instead he entered the Middle Temple to study law. He married twice, first in 1629 to an Iliff, who died six months later, then to Francis Aylesbury in 1634. They had six children who survived infancy, Henry 1638-1709, Lawrence 1642-1711, Edward 1645-1665, James 1650-1681, and 1638-1671, and Francis. As mother of two queens, and is the best remembered, but both Henry and Lawrence had significant political careers, the latter being an exceptionally able politician. Career pre-1640 1840, 1840.
Keen forty, keen forty. Hyde later admitted he had limited interest in a legal career and declared that next the immediate blessing and providence of God Almighty, he owed all the little he knew and the little good that was in him to the friendships and converse of the most excellent men in their several kinds that lived in that age. These included Ben Johnson, John Selden, Edmund Waller, John Hales, and especially Lord Falkland, who became his best friend. The diarist Samuel Pepys wrote thirty years later that he never knew anyone who could speak as well as Hyde. He was one of the most prominent members of the famous Great Two Circle, a group of intellectuals who gathered at Lord Falkland's country house Great Two, Oxfordshire. On 22 November 1633, he was called to the bar and obtained quickly a good position in practice. You may have great joy of your son Ned, his uncle, the Attorney General assured his father. Both his marriages gained him influential friends, and in December 1634, he was made keeper of the writs and rolls of the Court of Common Pleas. His able conduct of the petition of the London merchants against Lord Treasurer Portland earned him the approval of Archbishop William Laud, with whom he developed a friendship. The law did not make friends easily, and his religious views were very different from Hyde's. Hyde in his history explained that he admired Laud for his integrity and decency, and excused his notorious rudeness and bad temper, partly because of Laud's humble origins and partly because Hyde recognized the same weaknesses in himself. Career 1640-1660 in April 1640, Hyde was elected Member of Parliament for both Shaftesbury and Wooten Bassett in the short Parliament, and chose to sit for Wooten Bassett. In November 1640, he was elected MP for Saltash in the Long Parliament. Hyde was at first a moderate critic of King Charles I, but became more supportive of the King after he began to accept reforming bills from Parliament. Hyde opposed legislation restricting the power of the king to appoint his own advisers, viewing it unnecessary and an affront to the royal prerogative. He gradually moved over towards the royalist side, championing the Church of England and opposing the execution of the Earl of Strafford, Charles's primary adviser. Following the Grand Remonstrance of 1641, Hyde became an informal adviser to the king. He left London about 20 May 1642 and rejoined the king at York. In February 1643, Hyde was knighted and was officially appointed to the Privy Council. The following month he was made Chancellor of the Exchequer. Despite his own previous opposition to the king, he found it hard to forgive anyone, even a friend, who fought for Parliament, and he severed many personal friendships as a result. With the possible exception of John Pym, he detested all the parliamentarian leaders, describing Oliver Cromwell as a brave bad man and John Hampton as a hypocrite, while Oliver St. John's Fox's and Wolfe's speech, in favor of the attainder of Strafford, he considered to be the depth of barbarism. His view of the conflict and of his opponents was undoubtedly colored by the death of his best friend Lord Falkland at the First Battle of Newbury in September 1643. Hyde mourned his death which he called a loss most infamous and execrable to all posterity to the end of his own life. In 1644, the Royalist-controlled West Country was created a separate government under the Prince of Wales, with Hyde appointed to his general council, partially intended by his opponents as a way to remove him from access to the king. Hyde found it difficult to control his military commanders notably George Goring, Lord Goring, who, although a brave and capable cavalry general, often refused to follow orders and whose ill-disciplined troops gained a reputation for looting and drunkenness. Hyde described him as a man who would without hesitation have broken any trust or performed any act of treachery. After the royalist defeat, he fled to Jersey in 1646. His opposition to alliances with the Scots meant he was not closely involved with the 1648 Second English Civil War, which resulted in the execution of Charles I in January 1649. Despite their differences, he was horrified by the execution of Charles I. He later described Charles as a man who had an excellent understanding but was not sufficiently confident of it himself 
so that he often changed his opinion for a worse one and would follow the advice of a man who did not judge as well as himself. During this period, he began writing the history of the rebellion, but following defeat in the Third English Civil War in 1651, he resumed his position as advisor to Charles Roman II and was appointed Lord Chancellor on 13 January 1658. He also employed his sister Susanna as a royalist agent, arrested in 1656. She was held in Lameth Palace Prison, where she died soon after. Although other female spies are mentioned in his history, she does not appear. Career 1660-1667 After the Stuart Restoration in 1660, he returned to England and became even closer to the royal family through the marriage of his daughter and to the king's brother James, Duke of York. Contemporaries naturally assumed that Hyde had arranged the royal marriage of his daughter, but modern historians in general accept his repeated claims that he had no hand in it, and that indeed it came as an unwelcome shock to him. He is supposed to have told and that he would rather see her dead. There were good reasons for his opposition, since he may have hoped to arrange a marriage for James with a foreign princess, and he was well aware that nobody regarded his daughter as a suitable royal match, a view Clarendon shared. On the personal level he seems to have disliked James, whose impulsive attempt to repudiate the marriage can hardly have endeared him to his father-in-law, and enforced the rules of etiquette governing such marriages with great strictness, and thus caused her parents some social embarrassment, as commoners, they were not permitted to sit down in Anne's presence, or to refer to her as their daughter. As Cardinal Mazarin remarked, the marriage damaged Hyde's reputation as a politician, whether he was responsible for it or not. On 3 November 1660, he was raised to the peerage as Baron Hyde of Hinden in the county of Wiltshire, and the 20 April the next year, at the coronation, he was created Viscount Cornbury and Earl of Clarendon. He served as Chancellor of the University of Oxford from 1660 to 1667. As effective chief minister in the early years of the reign, he accepted the need to fulfill most of what had been promised in the Declaration of Brede, which he had partly drafted. In particular, he worked hard to fulfill the promise of mercy to all the king's enemies, except the regicides, and this was largely achieved in the Act of Indemnity and Oblivion. Most other problems he was content to leave to Parliament, and in particular to the restored House of Lords, his speech welcoming the Lord's return shows his ingrained dislike of democracy. He played a key role in Charles' marriage to Catherine of Braganza, with ultimately harmful consequences to himself. Clarendon liked and admired the Queen, and disapproved of the King's openly maintaining his mistresses. The King, however, resented any interference with his private life. Catherine's failure to bear children was also damaging to Clarendon given the nearness of his own grandchildren to the throne, although it is most unlikely, as was alleged, that Clarendon had planned deliberately for Charles to marry an infertile bride. He and Catherine remained on friendly terms. One of his last letters thanked her for her kindness to his family. As Lord Chancellor, it is commonly thought that Clarendon, in reality he was not very heavily involved with its drafting, and actually disapproved of much of its content. The great two circle of which he had been a leading member prided itself on tolerance and respect for religious differences. The code was thus merely named after him as chief minister. In 1663, he was one of eight lords proprietor given title to a huge tract of land in North America which became the province of Carolina. Shortly after this, an attempt was made to impeach him by George Digby, second Earl of Bristol, a long-standing political opponent from the Civil War. He was accused of arranging for Charles to marry a woman he knew to be barren to secure the throne for the children of his daughter Anne, while his palatial new mansion in Piccadilly was cited as evidence of corruption. He was also blamed for the sale of Dunkirk, and the cost of supporting the colony of Tangiers, acquired along with Bombay as part of Catherine's dowry. The windows of Clarendon House were broken, and a placard fixed to the house blaming Hyde for Dunkirk, 
while these allegations were not taken seriously and ended by damaging bristol more than hyde he became increasingly unpopular with the public and with charles whom he subjected to frequent lectures on his shortcomings his contempt for charles mistress barbara villiers duchess of cleveland earned him her enmity and she worked with the future members of the cabal ministry to destroy him his authority was weakened by increasing ill health in particular attacks of gout and back pain which became so severe that he was often incapacitated for months on end pepys records that early in sixteen sixty five he was forced to lie on a couch during council meetings even neutrals began to see him as a liability and when attempts to persuade him to retire failed some spread false reports that he was anxious to step down these included sir william coventry who later admitted to samuel pepys he was largely responsible for these reports he claimed this was because clarendon's dominance of policy and refusal to consider alternatives made even their discussion impossible in his memoirs clarendon makes clear his bitterness against coventry for what he regarded as betrayal which he contrasted with the loyalty shown by which his brother henry above all the military setbacks of the second anglo-dutch war of sixteen sixty five to sixteen sixty seven together with the disasters of the plague of sixteen sixty five and the great fire of london led to his downfall and the successful dutch raid on the medway in june sixteen sixty seven was the final blow to his career despite having opposed the war unlike many of his accusers he was removed from office as he left whitehall barbara villiers shouted abuse at him to which he replied with simple dignity madam pray remember that if you live you will also be old at almost the same time he suffered a great personal blow when his wife died after a short illness in a will drawn up the previous year he described her as my dearly beloved wife who hath accompanied and assisted me in all my distresses clarendon was impeached by the house of commons for blatant violations of habeas corpus for having sent prisoners out of england to places like jersey and holding them there without benefit of trial he was forced to flee to france in november sixteen sixty seven the king made it clear that he would not defend him which betrayal of his old and loyal servant harmed charles's reputation efforts to pass an act of attainder against him failed but an act providing for his banishment was passed in december and received the royal assent apart from clarendon's son-in-law the duke of york and henry coventry few spoke in his defence clarendon was accompanied to france by his private chaplain and ally william levitt later dean of bristol exile and death the rest of clarendon's life was passed in exile he left calais for rouen on twenty five december returning on twenty one january sixteen sixty eight visiting the baths of bourbon in april thence to avignon in june residing from july sixteen sixty eight till june sixteen seventy one at montpelier whence he proceeded to moulins and to rouen again in may sixteen seventy four his sudden banishment entailed great personal hardships his health at the time of his flight was much impaired and on arriving at calais he fell dangerously ill and louis roman fourteen anxious at this time to gain popularity in england sent him peremptory and repeated orders to quit france he suffered severely from gout and during the greater part of his exile could not walk without the aid of two men at evieux on twenty three april sixteen sixty eight he was the victim of a murderous assault by english sailors who attributed to him the non-payment of their wages and who were on the point of dispatching him when he was rescued by the guard for some time he was not allowed to see any of his children even correspondence with him was rendered treasonable by the act of banishment and it was not apparently until 1671, 1673, and 1674 that he received visits from his sons, the younger, Lawrence Hyde, being present with him at his death. He spent his exile updating and expanding his history, the classic account of the wars of the three kingdoms, and for which he is chiefly remembered today. The sale proceeds from this book were instrumental in building the Clarendon Building and Clarendon, fund at oxford university press he died in rouen france on nine december sixteen seventy four
Shortly after his death, his body was returned to England, and he was buried in a private ceremony in Westminster Abbey on 4 January 1675. Portrayals in Drama and Fiction Nigel Bruce played Sir Edward Hyde in the 1947 film The Exile, with Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. as Charles Roman II. In the film Cromwell, Clarendon called only Sir Edward Hyde in the film, is portrayed by Nigel Stock as a sympathetic, conflicted man torn between Parliament and the King. He finally turns against Charles I altogether when the King pretends to accept Cromwell's terms of peace but secretly and treacherously plots to raise a Catholic army against Parliament and start a second civil war. Clarendon reluctantly, but bravely, gives testimony at the King's trial, which is instrumental in condemning him to death. In the 2003 BBC TV miniseries Charles Roman II, The Power and the Passion, Clarendon was played by actor Ian McDiamond. His series portrayed Clarendon referred to as Sir Edward Hyde throughout as acting in a paternalistic fashion towards Charles Roman II, something the King comes to dislike. It is also intimated that he had arranged the marriage of Charles and Catherine of Braganza already knowing that she was infertile so that his granddaughters through his daughter and Hyde, who had married the future James Roman II, would event you. In the 2004 film Stage Beauty, starring Billy Crudup and Claire Danes, Clarendon again referred to simply as Edward Hyde is played by Edward Fox. In fiction, Clarendon is a minor character in an instance of The Finger Post by Ian Pears, and he is also a recurring character in the Thomas Chaloner series of mystery novels by Susanna Gregory. Both authors show him in a fairly sympathetic light.